Um, OK, neurovascular blocking agents. Uh, well, as you've heard, most studies, but not all in the past, have shown that NMBAs are the big baddie, uh, and we are now learning that that is not the case. Uh, most previous studies have been severely hampered by denominator uh, data uh, problems, uh, and that's not the case here. Uh, we haven't mentioned that there, is, there appears to be a considerable geographical variation between countries in NMBA anaphylaxis. Uh, and we don't know why. Uh, we think it probably is real. Um, uh, but that emphasizes the importance uh, of investigating anaphylaxis in particular patient groups, index groups, and, and as, of course, is the UK. We already know that in NMBAs, as, as, as Bill mentioned earlier, cross-reactivity is extremely frequent. Uh, uh, and uh, we've mentioned avoidance of NMBAs, if possible, uh, in urgent, really urgent uh, surgery if an MBA was given before the previous event, uh, and the need to do a proper panel. We haven't mentioned, oh, well, we have mentioned specifically uh, atricurium and mivacurium and their propensity for non-allergic anaphylaxis. There's a lot that's uncertain, though. We, we didn't know prior to NAP6 what the UK pattern uh, was. Um, uh, we didn't know about the risk ladder. Um, there has been a general feeling that NMBA anaphylaxis is worse than any other anaphylaxis. Mm. Um, there's been a huge and I think kind of unrealistic debate about whether ROC is better than or worse than ATRA, uh, and people tend to become very polarised. Uh, and they're rock lovers or atra lovers. Uh, it's rather strange, never quite understood that. Um, there's a question about uh, Sergamidex uh, eff effectiveness in rocuronium anaphylaxis um, and the Falcadine story. Uh, so many of you may not have heard the Falcadine story, uh, which uh, um, emanated out of uh, Scandinavia, uh, where investigation was done to see why, perhaps in Norway, uh, there were more NMBA and anaphylaxis cases than there might have been. Uh, and perhaps the quaternary ammonium epitope, epitope was appearing in the environment somewhere. Uh, and yes, it was. It was in a cough medicine called Tuxi, T-U-X-I. Uh, and uh, since Tuxi was withdrawn, a uh, recent study, which I'll allude to by De Pater, has actually shown a reduction in sensitization to saxomethonium and falcadine uh, in terms of specific IgE. Um, and how often is anaphylaxis due to reversal drugs? Well, what's the pattern of NMBA use? Well, atricurium is still just about the UK's favorite, um, introduced in uh, 1984, it's a bit of a dinosaur drug. Um, some unknown reason, cisatricurium hasn't caught on, a much cleaner version of atricurium. Uh, and you can see it's way down there in terms of usage, uh, and it's not that much more expensive these days, a bit bizarre. Um, we know that NMBAs are used in about 47%, about half general anaesthetics. Compared with uh, previous uh, NAP, uh, NMBA use appears to be decreasing. Sox use, in addition, is decreasing. We've still got a rump of pancuronium use there, mainly in, the, uh, in, in some cardiac cases, for some extraordinary reason. Uh, so antibiotics, we now know, and we know from today's data that antibiotics are the at the top of the ladder. 65 cases were due to NMBAs, 94 to and lots more to antibiotics. Uh, we know about an, uh, the tycoplanin risk, uh, which numerically, it's perhaps important to remember, numerically uh, in terms of risk is higher than that of succinthonium, which as anaesthetists we tended to believe was the bet noir. Uh, well, tyco is worse. Um, perceptions of risks, NMBAs were suspected by the anaesthetists in 81 uh, cases compared with 65 actual uh, sorry, uh, uh, 65 actual cases uh, due to NMBAs. So we are still uh, of the view that M NMBAs were overestimating the, the risk with NMBAs. Uh, uh, when you leave uh, these four walls today, uh, you will be in the vanguard of people who believe otherwise. Um, and three, uh, two thirds of anaesthetists avoid an NMBA due to the perception of high risk, and only one in 10 uh, with antibiotics. That's quite interesting. Um, that will change. Is NMBA anaphylaxis more severe? Very difficult to tell from our data. Um, 
if we look at the deaths, well, there were, only, you know, thank goodness there were only 10. Um, and then MBOs were responsible for, you know, 40% uh, for four of those deaths and 33% of the general reactions. Fatalities, again, numbers are tiny, three rocuronium and one succinmethonium. I don't think we can uh, actually draw any firm conclusions for that. Um, succinmethonium anaphylaxis, quite interesting because we all believe, I certainly did, that you know, succinmethonium anaphylaxis is the worst thing that could ever happen. Uh, but if you look at the third bar there, you can see that a significant portion, proportion of sucks cases uh, were grade three, the lesser of the three grades. Uh, so, you know, it's not necessarily um, uh, a sign that all the, wall, all the wheels have fallen off simultaneously uh, if the patient uh, has an anaphylactic reaction to succinmethonium. Now, the rocuronium atricurium debate. Um, we're not going to be able to add very much to that. Um, <coughs> succinmethonium, if we look at the anaphylaxis rate in the right-hand column per 100,000 exposures, succinmethonium is 11.1 .1 per 100,000. And then coming after that, rocuronium and atricurium quite close, uh, mivacurium very small numbers, only one case. And then if we look at the confidence intervals, which is the important thing, if they're grossly overlapping, uh, then we really can't say statistically that there is a significant difference between the two. Succinmethonium confidence intervals on the right there uh, overlap to a certain degree with rock and atra, but look at the overlap between rock and atra. There's a very, very considerable uh, overlap there in the 95% confidence intervals. We just can't say one or the other, much as the uh, various pro proponents of one or the other would uh, like to disagree. Um, so, uh, how often is anaphylaxis caused by reversal agents? Um, we had a single case of Sigamadex anaphylaxis. Um, as you may know, um, hypersensitivity to uh, Sigamadex was a, a real problem with the FDA, uh, many, oh, at the FDA uh, many years ago. Uh, and in terms of licensing Sigamadex, there were lots and lots of concerns. Um, uh, we saw one case. Um, it's interesting that the use of Sigamadex has increased fourfold uh, since 2013. Uh, and I found it was interesting that 5.7% of patients receiving uh, an N NMBA now receive uh, Sigamadex. Um, worldwide, there have been several cases of Sigamadex anaphylaxis. Um, we didn't see any cases of Neostigmine-induced anaphylaxis, despite the fact that uh, it was administered in 57.4% of patients who received a muscle relaxant. Um, uh, and the Cambridge group in the UK described a single, UK, a single case uh, in the year 2000. So neostigmine anaphylaxis uh, practically uh, or very, very, very rarely happens. Falcadine, uh, interesting story, uh, 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 and our clinic uh, uh, contributed to the story earlier on, uh, early on with, with uh, some sera from our patients. Um, there is evidence that exposure to falcadine cough medicines may cause sensitization, uh, specific IgE sensitization to NMBAs. Um, and withdrawal of falcadine cough medicines has made a difference, a significant difference to the likelihood that the population have a specific, uh, elevated specific IgE to succinmethonium and falcadine. Um, and I don't, think, I don't think that is um, in dispute. Um, we were rather disappointed, um, especially as in um, you know, our own clinic, we've asked about exposure to falcadine for many, many years. Um, but we asked the specific question um, uh, of the local coordinators um, was exposure to uh, falcadine recorded uh, and that was really only, re only uh, sought by the allergy clinic uh, in 15 patients. So uh, the allergy clinic only asked 15 patients uh, who had an anaphylactic reaction uh, do you take falcadine cough medicines? Uh, very disappointing I have to say uh, and as a result of that uh, we can't really say we can't really come to any conclusions from our data. 
both the patients uh, uh, who had recorded previous falcadine exposure, and they took falcadine cough medicines, had NMBA anaphylaxis, but that doesn't prove anything because we don't know how, in how many patients the converse was true. So recommendations, I've just kept them to the minimum. Uh, individual recommendations, um, how do we choose which uh, muscle relaxant we give, which non-depolarizer, or in fact, indeed, which NMBA in general? Um, do we, should we take into account the risk of anaphylaxis when we make a choice? Uh, and uh, the review panel decided uh, that we should uh, the risk of anaphylaxis shouldn't be a, a, an overriding factor when we're deciding which NMBA to give because anaphylaxis is so very, very, very uncommon, whereas other factors, clinical factors to do with organ dysfunction and that sort of thing, are very, very common, and those really are the overriding factors. So what I'm suggesting is that we don't get too carried away with the particular risk of anaphylaxis with one muscle relaxant as opposed to another, uh, and that we continue to use clinical judgment on a case-by-case -case basis uh, in relation to other reasons, clinical reasons, why we might choose one relaxant or another. And further research on, on falcadine is needed, and uh, a plea to all uh, anaesthetic allergy clinics, uh, please ask uh, about Falcadine exposure. Thank you very much. Thanks, Nigel. Well done. Now, the next two um, talks are Blink and You'll Miss It. Um,